You are watching Trading Day. Thank you so much for tuning in. So it's a big question right now. What does the back half look like, especially for the U.S. market, which has already hit more than 30 all-time highs so far this year? Our next guest says we're going to go even higher. We could reach 6,000 before the end of 2024 for the S&P 500. But after that, that's when the trouble sets in. Let's bring in Barry Bannister, Managing Director and Chief Equity Strategist at Stiefel. Barry, thank you so much for joining us. Let's just start with this year, um, maybe because that's the optimistic part uh, of the equation. What gets us to 6,000? Well, I, uh, the reporter who picked up on the report that we wrote um, took the last paragraph in the last exhibit. Uh, what we said was, is that we're expecting a near-term correction, a pretty significant one, in the third quarter. We're gonna have a moderate case of stagflation, which is weaker than expected economic growth with much stickier than expected inflation. It's gonna alarm investors a little bit, and I think it might even tighten up financial conditions a bit. That would be enough to bring the PE ratio down in the third quarter. But there is a wall of money, $6,000 billion, that is left over from COVID, that is in the hands of wealthy people and corporations. Uh, that's where the money goes. Remember, they handed the money out. People spent it. They got inflation. They spent it on people who own businesses. Now businesses own the money. So that wall of money is looking for a place to invest. And... Uh, even if the Fed cuts rates, they'll be looking for a place to invest. So you could conceivably have a rise in the fourth quarter and then round trip based on the average bubble that we've been in in the last 150 years. There have been five of them. Um, this is financial PE bubbles, price earnings ratios. You could round trip all the way back to at or below 5,000 by first quarter of 26. Uh, and the catalyst would be probably the Fed overshooting, a recession, uh, a hit to earnings, and other things related to geopolitics. So I want to be clear about what you're saying. We could be headed in for some near-term weakness before we see a sharp recovery at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah, but the, you know, I, I prefer, it's like driving a car. It's always a good idea to at least once in a while look way down the road so there's no surprises. Uh, I prefer to think beyond just the end of 2024 in six months or less. Uh, I, I'm thinking already about 2025 and beyond. And there, um, you know, I don't want to overpay for stocks in the near term and then get blindsided uh, next year at a very high valuation for stocks. Well, I guess let's take this um, bit by bit. If, if you want to focus on what happens next year, what are some of the tailwinds that you think come out of the market um, that, that keep things suppressed? Yeah, right now, uh, we've got some optimism in the market, as I just said, about AI. The cap-weighted, capitalization-weighted, biggest companies count more. The cap-weighted PE ratio of the S&P 500 is pulled dramatically away from what's called the equal-weighted S&P 500. So all 500 companies treated equally in terms of an average. Um, the equal weighted index is actually right in line with where the financial conditions index is. You can use Bloomberg's or Goldman's or the Fed's. It's about right. So what's happened is it's the tech optimism, the AI optimism. I remember the electric vehicle optimism, and then suddenly people decided that they uh, would take a lot longer to adopt. So I'm a little bit concerned, but I've seen this before. You know, I've been a bank employed financial analyst for 40 years, and maybe I can go another 40. And um, it takes a generation to forget a bubble. And in the late 90s bubble, 25 years ago, uh, it was called the new economy, and everyone thought uh, that uh, the people who doubted it would be proved wrong. Well, the NASDAQ fell 78% in two and a half years. So for investors, it's not the economy, and for investors, it's not uh, whether it's a good story, it's what price you pay. And right now we have uh, narrow markets with high valuations, over ownership in the household sector, day traders with strange names, just like back in the 90s, political theater, overzealous prosecutors. Back then it was Ken Starr going after the Clintons. Um, you know, all of history repeats and we're just doing it again. 
let's unpack some of that. You know, I'm glad that you brought up you've been doing this for 40 years because when you look at the markets over that time, those pullbacks are but a blip. And if you just hold on, well, they certainly are, right? Uh, if you look at how much higher we are from the, the peak of 2000, um, investors with that long-term horizon, if they stuck it through, they just continued to move higher. The U.S. has been nothing short of a stunning market over that period of time. Yeah, but keep in mind that from March of 2000, it took two and a half years till October of 2002 for the NASDAQ index to bottom down 78%. Um, it's a grinding period. There was a false rally in the middle of it and then another leg down. Um, this happened also in the 70s with a similar backdrop of what's called the Nifty 50. 50, not really 50, it was probably closer to 20, one decision stocks that you bought that were high quality tech or growth names relate, related to consumers. Um, those high PE stocks actually did have phenomenal earnings the next 25 years. They out earned the S&P by a wide margin. The problem was the macro environment compressed the PE ratio of those stocks and they underperformed the market over the next 25 years. So the issue really is um, anything in this market with this level of patience in the market, anything lasting more than three months is an eternity. Imagine two years. Um, that's what happened in 73, 74 after the Nifty 50 burst. So I, I have to be macro, bigger picture, and deal with clients who have long-term investment needs. And when I tell them right now the valuations you're paying have locked in a single digit low single digit return for the next 10 years um, some of them it will make their investment goals some of them it will not and uh, investors shouldn't be overzealous uh, in terms of how they approach their forward return expectations i think that's great perspective and great context what do you say to the pushback um against the parallels of that dot-com era, which is that the companies this time around are different in terms of their financial health. Uh, they survived that period and they have uh, cashed up businesses. Their balance sheets are in, in great shape. And so they're not at risk of being wiped off the way that they might have been back then. Now, they'll, they'll, technology itself, though, is a very short cycle, short life cycle industry. The darlings of, uh, of the current time uh, get replaced in creative destruction. Um, we've seen that many, many times over history. So, uh, you know, AI could displace the search models of many of the big uh, companies out there, such as Alphabet. Uh, AI could displace uh, a lot of service industries and make a lot of people have what they call deflation or negative price associated with their profession because the productivity goes up so fast and so many compete that they can offer discounts. Um, if you have service inflation go down and you can't AI gold or a house or a ton of copper, then you could have relative inflation of goods prices relative to services over time and particularly commodities. When commodities do well, stocks generally don't do well. It's almost like if Canada's doing well, it's not a good thing for uh, the United States. Um, and so the future environment is going to hinge very much on what happens with inflation and productivity. And we do pretty extreme macro analysis on inflation and productivity and drivers. That's why we think that we're going to beat the Fed's 2.8% core PCE target for 2024. We also think that GDP will weaken somewhat mm. sharply in the back half. And when that happens, it's going to cause a lot of alarm, I think, in the market by August, September, which is typically weak market months. Well, you brought up Canada. So does that mean the Canadian equities have a shot? Yeah, you got a shot. <laughs> um, commodities look good. We think commodities will actually do well over the next decade. Um, and when you take stock market, S&P divided by commodity index, uh, it pretty much tracks the secular bull, secular bear, up cycles, down cycles for the S&P 500. Right now, uh, the stock market has already peaked, it peaked in 2020 versus commodities. It's only a question now of how far it falls. And uh, over the course of 10, 12 years, uh, we think it will fall. 
commodities will outperform. It's good for Canada.